build HQs, HQs as soon as they're available. If I hadn't already mentioned that, I'm going to say it again because it's definitely a foot stomp. Please, 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 as soon as those HQs are available, build them. So I don't know if we're any, uh, are any are available this turn. Nope, but as soon as they are, build them. Um, be sure to use engineers wherever possible. So I'm going to go back to St. Louis in a moment here, but I just want to illustrate. Because you are, even though you're not, you, you shouldn't be spending too much time digging in as the union, you know, necessarily. Like you want to be, you want to be thinking offensive. The biggest opportunity for the Confederates to really schwack you is after you attack. So you need to win battles to win the game because that affects your national morale. The best way for the, the Confederates to really hit your national morale hard, get their national morale back, and get their get themselves in a position to even the odds in terms of numbers, is to attack you after you've, you've attacked. Because one, your cohesion is going to be a little bit low from, from engaged in battle. Especially, for example, we attacked Longstreet. River crossing, um, we're on the attack. Chances are, even if we win this battle, he's still going to be in the region with us, and we won't be dug in, and we'll have a massive cohesion hit from crossing the river. Well, if you have a guy like Green, who um, reduces by 10% the time necessary to obtain the next entrenchment level, you have an engineer who reduces by 35% the amount of time necessary to get to the next entrenchment level. And then if you have a pontoon, that's the river crossing. Another 10%, that's what 20, that's 35% decreased amount of time to dig in before being attacked. So that really closes the gap and closes the window the Confederates will have to counterattack. Basically, if they're not in position to counterattack the next turn, you're going to be in pretty good shape the turn after and be pre be pretty well dug in with this sort of composition, with like with this sort of composition. Composition we have a general like this, a pontoon, and an engineer. And honestly, as a as a, as a union, you can af you can afford the engineers. They're 52 bucks. You get a lot of money each turn. Um, you can afford those guys, so you should be using them. Use the signal officers for your independent command divisions. Be sure to use that. Uh, you don't really need them for your course, but for your independent um, divisions, you're going to want to use those guys. Set your mind on strategic locations and stick to the plan. So what I mean by that is, for example, if you're watching my demo in 61, the Confederates were all up in my grill up in my Chile, up in Western Virginia. And I was like, so what? You know, like, he can go waste his troops up here. My goal is Manassas and Richmond, right? And the Shenandoah over here in the east. I don't really care so much about Western Virginia. There's no way he can sustain an offensive up here while at the same time defend himself down here. Not this early in the game. And what ended up happening was, like we thought, winter hit. He got isolated. We destroyed one division. And then we've got another division up here, or two, I think it's one division here. Yeah, two, two divisions actually, that are completely cut off from supply and are completely cut off. So he just lost three divisions going up here in, in Western Virginia. So have objectives, stick to them. Don't let the Confederates distract you too much. Um, so, you know, objective number one, hold DC. Objective number two, take Manassas. Objective number three, get across the Rappahannock so that you can prepare some sort of um, eventual offensive on Richmond. That's that's what I mean by strategic objectives. Kentucky, you know, take take Bowling Green before the winter so that you can set up a deep a supply depot and, you know, fortify in. In 62, take Nashville. Um, over here on the Mississippi, take Paducah. In 62, take Memphis. You know, those, those kind of objectives um, is the best way to not only figure out how many forces you need to dedicate to each theater, but also keeps you from getting distracted from what the, the Confederates are doing because they're going to be behind your rear, tearing up your rail lines, attacking your supply depots, um, trying to keep you off your game. But if you kind of stick to the plan and say, this is the objective I need, this is how I'm going to win the game, is doing this, this, and this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take you a, a long way. Um, speaking of protecting your supply lines and stuff, 
Let me see here before I jump into that. Yeah, let me just talk on Calvary just real quick, and then I'll go back to what I was going to say before that. Uh, for for Calvary, what I would say do is you should have at least one full division per theater. I think it's that's pretty helpful to have ultimately. And so I don't have it here because we're only in 62. But uh, what you can ultimately have is have one full division of cavalry with maybe, say, three or four pieces of horse artillery. That's going to be like your really your hammer, um, hammer division that you're going to use to protect, you know, um, your flanks and perhaps hide the overall strength of your units. So the way that I can see that he has 3,000 power here is two reasons. One, I have enough cavalry here to see it. So I've got three, four, five, seven cavalry um, in this region. And so that's why I can see it because he doesn't have enough cavalry to mask my cavalry's view of things. Now, if he had an entire division of cavalry here, it's possible I wouldn't be able to see what he has. Um, now, granted, I also have a balloon, which also helps with visibility. But my point being is if you want to mask your movements or decrease the opponent's ability to see what you have, you got to have cavalry. So I think one full division of cavalry per region eventually in the game is pretty helpful. And then for the rest of your cavalry, either you know built in with your divisions, but then also I think what's helpful is two, let's see, I think right here, this is a good composition right here, two cavalry and a horse artillery, and then have a couple of those floating behind your lines to go deal with partisans and enemy ranger units and other small cavalry units that are coming in between your behind your lines for intel to tear up your rail lines and attack your supply depots. This seems to be a really good composition for that. Also, you know, have a um, a light artillery uh, stack. You know, maybe not a full division, maybe half a division at key depot places like, for example, Salem, and you know. Vincennes and that sort of thing. Additionally, for cavalry, if you put them on green, green, evade combat, you can go behind enemy lines and get some intel on on what what's going on. So green, green, evade combat, and use them to obtain military control. So like right here, we now have 100% military control. The way we did that is we went orange, green, evade combat. The offensive posture increases your military control much quicker than being in some sort of passive mode or defense. I think on passive, you don't even get any military control, to be honest with you. So do that. I did the same thing over here to get military control. The higher the military control, the more supply throughput you get there. So that's why it's important, especially for the rail lines. And then if you want to block enemy supply, so for example, here at Springfield, you've got to be... Well, probably Springfield's not a good example. Let me see if I can find a rail line. Um... So for example here, uh, Rala. If he wanted to block supply getting to Rala, he could put a cavalry unit here on the rail line, but as long as I have more than 75% military control, or actually 25% military control, we will get some supply through there. So if you want to fully block it, because it'll go around, you got to put three across. So a partisan, partisan cavalry, or cavalry, cavalry, partisan, whatever. but you gotta have it three across to fully block supply getting to Rala because the supply will just go around. Um, but then otherwise use cavalry to tear up rail line, take a seize supply depots and burn them, uh, or use them for intelligence. You can, with cavalry, take cities that are um, one or two level cities. So like right here, this is a size two city. This guy could actually take over that city if he wanted. Um, same with, with here. This is size one city. Use one cavalry to take it. Bear in mind that if they don't have any artillery, they may end up in a siege of these areas, and make it takes longer to take it. So if you have horse artillery, it'll it'll end up allowing them to take these areas much quicker. But do bear in mind that you can use cavalry, single unit cavalrys to take these cities, city one, uh, level one and twos even without artillery. Also, and this is my final point on cavalry before I move on, you can use cavalry and ranger units to take forts. So there's a, I think it's like a 50% chance that when you besiege a stockade that a unit will pop up to defend it. 
But if it doesn't, then you can take over the stockade with one uh, ranger element or one cavalry element. So that's pretty helpful to know too. Speaking of stockades, and this is kind of going back to where I was going to go, if you try as best as possible not to lose your north to south, you know, um, stockade highway here, and the same for your west to east stockade highway up here, the one that goes to Denver. The reason is is that some supply throughput does go from Kansas, from from like Council Bluffs, for example over to Denver each turn. If you lose these forts, that doesn't happen anymore. So bear in mind that these forts are a supply line to Colorado. And your forts north to east here in Missouri are important because what it allows you to do is allows you to outflank a Confederate held Springfield by attacking Fayetteville. If you lose the forts north to south here in Kansas, then um, you're really relegated to a, an offensive from St. Louis, um, and he's going to be able, obviously, to anticipate that. So you're going to want to try as best as possible hold these forts to do some sort of flanking or rear movement into Fayetteville um, in, in Missouri. Have a core. Let's see. Make sure I got everything on that one. I've got notes that I'm going through here. Okay, have a core ready for Grant in, um, in in Illinois because as soon as Kentucky's in play, you want to be able to move south. So um, we made him an army commander. If you're watching my Union um, kind of demo, you'll see how we got him to army. But you want to have a, you know, a, 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 as close to a core as possible in Cairo and then the same uh, up in Kentucky because what you want to be able to do is rapidly move down the rail line as far as you can into Kentucky and then you want to try and seize Paducah as soon as possible. Once you take Paducah, you're on the correct side of the river, and then you have a lot of options available to you. You can move on Fort Donaldson, you can move south down towards Memphis and Corinth, uh, or what you can do is you can take this rail line here and then use that as a way to kind of backdoor Nashville. So have a core ready in Cairo and Kentucky to move down on Bowling Green and Paducah so that you then can have a variety of options available to you. As soon as you can, try and get Grant and Lyons promoted. So in our playthrough, what we did was we had Lyons engaged in several several battles. Lyons engaged in several battles in Missouri. Um, that ultimately led to him being able to get promoted. We had to do a little bit of finagling with the different army commanders so that we didn't piss anybody off. But we ultimately were able to get him up to army um, command. And then the same thing for Grant. We got him in some battles um, going down in Kentucky. And so he was able to get promoted to three-star. So these two guys, I think you need to be your priority in terms of getting promoted. You also want to try and get uh, Sherman promoted uh, to Corps Command as quickly as possible. And you want to try and get uh, Kearney promoted to Corps Command as soon as possible. I, I want to say he maintains his four strategic rating as a Corps Commander. Um, I can't remember if he just automatically promotes. Some of these commanders just automatically promote over time. And I don't think he's one of them though but you want to try and get him as a core commander as well when you build rangers I recommend moving a lot of them to the east because you can do a lot of damage to the confederates early in the game uh, down around behind the rear you can tear up these rail lines you can go after their supply depots um, you can be just overall pretty effective with them um, I don't know where I put them in this game but they're somewhere. <laughs> but those rangers that you can build, I would recommend moving some of them over to the east because they can be they can be pretty helpful, I think. Um, let's see if uh, uh, I just want to show you who I'm talking about. If I can build any more right now. Nope. Okay, I build all of them. But use those rangers um, as effectively as possible and, and move some of them to the east. I think they're it's a nice surprise. Um, here, here, there, here's one. It's a nice surprise for the, uh, the Confederates. Um, what I end up doing was because of the winter months, I moved them back to Kentucky, and I'm using them to get military control, as you can see, um, orange screen. But then also too, um, I'm going to use them to kind of pierce down once the weather clears up here, and go after these rail lines and tear those up. Um, build and repair ships 
in an area where there's a naval engineer. So this is what I meant by I was going to go back to St. Louis. So here we have a naval engineer. And what they do is they speed up naval construction and repairs. So anytime you have a ship that needs to be repaired or um, you're building ships, build them where you have these naval engineers. I think there's one in Boston. You don't have them immediately when the game starts. They just kind of they come up over time. So this guy wasn't here when we first started the game. But um, we got one there. We got one in Philadelphia. Right here. And I want to say there might be one in New York, too. Yeah, so just be sure to build and repair ships in those areas where they, where they, where they are at. And I would not recommend building any more naval engineers because you have plenty um, that are provided to you already. The same goes for your ships. I wouldn't build more ships necessarily, not not your blue water fleet. Um, you definitely need to build up a river fleet. You don't have much of that. But as far as your, your navy is concerned, you get a pretty good starting navy. And so I don't really see the need necessarily to build any more naval ships. Um, just sustain the ones that you already have. Um, and instead, expend your resources on, on these naval um, replacement chits. Um, you're going to want to use four elements of ships in the Potomac and elsewhere in the game to kind of um, stop the movement of the Confederates. So, for example, we have these guys here. So we've got four frigates and a transport hanging out right here. And what you need to do is you need to have them on a, a, at least blue-orange. If they are in green-green, which will allow them to stay afloat longer, but it also won't um, cause them to engage with the enemy who tries to cross. So you need to have them at least on blue and then not evade combat. And what it'll do is with four elements on a on a square, I think it's like a 90% chance or something that you'll engage an enemy trying to cross and it will usually stop them from crossing. So if he took Alexandria with a core, these ships right here could stop him from crossing this river and cause him to have to go around. Another good place to do it is over here in Cairo. So like we have here. So I've got him here, and then I've got these guys right here, which means he's going to go around if he wants to try and uh, attack Cairo. So be sure to use your, your river fleet, um, or use the rivers to your advantage, and use your ships to, to block um, movements to and from. Also build river boats for supply. So build a lot of them. These, these river transports, they're not expensive. I want to say they're... I don't want to... Is quoted here. They're 40 money, 8 conscripts, 20 war supply. But what you can do is you can you can really look at how many how much supply you actually have. It'll tell you. So let's see your supply. So we have 372 points of supply with these three transports. Alright. Well, how much would this guy would Hamilton's core costs if we were just feeding off of those three transports? Well, he uses 67 a turn. So that's a good way. Um, if you build a bunch of river transports, what you can do is really put the, the Confederates off, off balance. And if they're, say, right behind this river and you don't want to do a frontal attack, and say you take these areas so you don't have to worry about being shot up, you could go around their back, land in Memphis, and if you have enough transports, you could sustain yourself for, you know, months without being connected to your supply line. And there is a four, level four supply depot here. So the theory being you would float down with a boatload of, and no pun intended, of river transports, land, and then take Memphis over time. And then uh, with that four supply depot, uh, now you're, you're all set. Now, that you know, you'd obviously have to find some way to get reconnected with your supply line at some point because that's not going to sustain you forever. But it's, it's it's an option, right, to give you a way to outflank the Confederates and use your river your river fleet to your advantage. Timber clads are great, right? They're a lot cheaper than your iron clads, and I think that's a really good way to supplement your river fleet. Um, timber clads are 42 to 50. 42 to 50, right? Whereas an ironclad is 50 to 170. So a little bit more expensive. 
So instead of building all river clads, what I would say you do is do like we did here, where you have just a mix and match of river clads and timber clads. Okay. Um, I would say consider blockading down here at Galveston Bay. If you can block blockade Galveston Bay, it prohibits the Confederates from getting the the 50 bucks every once in a while from their cotton exports because that's where it comes from. So if you take that away from them, it takes away the opportunity to get that 50 bucks. I would recommend taking almost all your blockade ships and putting them in the, the Gulf the Gulf blockade and the Atlantic Atlantic blockade. So five and five with a transport on green green so they can stay out a lot longer. And then if you just swap out the transports, you should never have to put these guys back into into dock. And then put one down here. Um, so if you have Fort Pickens, all you need I think was eight naval elements to blockade here. So you take this, this is ten, or they actually think this is eight. And transport green green um, you've once again you've blockaded another area of the Confederacy which then boosts your your percentage um, as well and then obviously uh, another way to blockade without actually having to conquer anything per se is taking out the, the various forts so if we took out these two forts to New Orleans then we've blockaded New Orleans um, not completely but we will have blockaded it by 50% and the same thing for Charleston for example if we take Fort Sumter, um, I think that in of itself allows you to blockade Charleston. But if it doesn't, if you take these forts, then you will blockade Charleston. And really, you won't need a much of a force to hold it because they're, they're going to be they're going to have a tough time taking it back. Especially a place like Fort Sumter where you can take it and then put a fleet here in the water section area, the, the four elements, uh, and he just won't be able to cross and get it. Do not, do not, do not lose Fort Monroe. So the way you do that is you have a unit here, um, either on orange, orange, or blue, orange, that keeps him from crossing and, and besieging Fort Monroe. If you lose Fort Monroe, then what will happen is not only will Richmond not be blockaded anymore, so they'll get a, a profound amount of increased production from that, but DC will be blockaded. <laughs> so um, very problematic, as you can see. So do not lose Fort Monroe. It is very, very important to hold um, from the Union perspective. Um, not so important with Fort Pickens if they try and take it, whatever. Um, but you can use Fort Pickens as a way to assault Atlanta. So Montgomery and then Atlanta. So to keep that in mind. Um, also, too, if you move up this river here, you can also assault Atlanta, which is the backup capital for the Confederacy. So if you take Atlanta and then take Richmond, game over. He's got nowhere to move his capital to. Build all transports available to you in the game. Um, I'm still, I was still working on it in this game, but I should have been done with it by now. So build all of these until you can't build anymore, and then move almost all of them down to the shipping lanes and put them in here. Okay. Uh, a thing to note. Every transport you add to your shipping lane decreases the overall uh, value of the transport. So if transport number one produces 25 bucks per turn, transport number two is going to provide 20 bucks per turn. Transport three is going to be like 18 bucks a turn, you know, so it's, and it just kind of goes down. But I, I think you should take build all the transports you can, put them all down here, and then as you need transports, take them out and put them back in the, you know, back in operation, but um, build all the transports, put them in here. That's going to get you cash and war supply, and then what will happen is, after you have so much war supply, it gets converted into cash. So I want to say for every 500 war supply that doesn't go used, it'll take 50 of that and convert it into, into cash. So build all the transports you can and put them in the shipping lanes. Um, uh, you could also use Briggs as kind of like a cavalry of the sea and put them on green green. So say we had a Brig here, for example, let me see, do I have any Briggs? I do. So I could take him, maybe even with the transport if I wanted, but I don't have to put him on green green, put him over here in Coney Island because he has a pretty high evade rate. Chances are he's not going to get fired upon by the fort. And if he's on green green evade combat, He's not going to get shot at, and if you have a, a balloon on on there, 
you'll be able to have a pretty good idea of what he has in New Orleans. So, I think use the scouts, put him on Green Green Evade Combat, put a balloon on there, stick him in like Coney Island, near Charleston, and a couple other strategic locations, and that'll, that'll give you a decent idea of, you know, what he has in terms of um, defenses and so forth. Uh, one final thing I'm going to note on blockades, just just right quick. Brown water blockades increases the percentage, but it only limits the cash production of the area. So it's not as effective as a blue water blockade, but you are going to want to do some brown water blockading if you want to get that percentage up on the Confederacy. And there's differing mi differing minds on in terms of how effective the blockade is on a Confederate player. I think it's valuable to do, um, especially in a long long haul game. But just, just bear in mind that the brown water blockading isn't as effective as a blue water, but you're going to need both if you want to maximize your ability to blockade the Confederacy. Now, final point I'm going to make in this video, and hopefully I covered enough to, to be pretty helpful. Beware of 1864. So, in 1864, because it's the election cycle, um, there is an increased risk of losing the game. I forget what the number is off the top of my head. But notice defeat level is 40 to, to lose the game right now. Um, and then for Confederates, I, I forget what the, the, the victory... They need like 140 national morale or something to win. In 1864, the number is different. I think the defeat level is like 60. So if our national morale falls below 60, we lose the game. And for the Confederates, all they need is say like a national morale of like 130 instead of 140 or whatever it is. To, to win the game. So beware of that. If I'm a Confederate player and we are going into 64, I'm probably going to be pretty, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be taking some chances at that point and being pretty risky because that's going to be the chance to win the game. So just be aware of 64. Be aware of this change. What will happen is when 64 hits, this will tell you what the new numbers are. And it's going to be like that all the way until I think November of 64. So be careful of that. Uh, one final thing, actually, before I conclude this video. If your capital is under siege, you can still move it. So, if, say, next turn, uh, Beauregard makes it down, or Johnson makes it down to D.C., and D.C. is under siege, until such time as it, as it is actually captured, I can move my capital to New York City. All right? So long as I do that, before they actually capture DC, I will only suffer 10 national morale, as opposed to, I think, the 50 national morale swing that's, that's suffered as a result of losing the capital. Okay. So, also uh, important to note is say we go and take Richmond on turn one, and then they take Richmond back on turn two. So long as they didn't move their capital, they're going to suffer a 50 national morale hit, even if they get it back the next turn. It does not matter. If you lose it, that's it. That's that's the national mor the morale lit, loss. So just make sure if you're under siege, if you don't think you'll be able to get that capital back, just go ahead and move it. Um, it's not the end of the world. Again, it's only a 10 national morale swing. And um, the, I think the way to, to really beat the Confederates is to take Atlanta before you take Richmond and then hope that you can hold Atlanta until such time as you take Richmond because then the, the game's over. They, don't have a, they can't move their capital. Um, and they're going to suffer um, that 50 national morale hit and have no capitals. So, all right, with that, I hope this video was helpful. I know it's pretty long. I uh, apologize for that. Again, the, there's, a, there's a lot in the game to talk to. And if there's any additional tips that you can think of for the Union, please include them here uh, or any questions that you have. And thanks again, as always, for watching this. Hopefully this video, the demo that I did, um, kind of going through turn by turn up until about the winter of 61 and then concluding it here in March 62. And then um, the other video I did with some considerations when you're playing as a union is enough to get you playing the union and being successful. All right. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.